Thanks, everyone. I'm just loud enough. Um, so tonight we'll be hearing from Jill and Jackie, as I said, and um, so each will present for about 15 minutes. Um, so if you do have any questions during that presentation time, keep a hold of them, remember them, because then after each presentation there'll also be some Q&A time. Um, so I'll move straight over to our speakers. Um, so first, just to introduce Jill. So Jill is a practice leader at Legal Vision, which is a law firm that um, has a lot of startup clients, specialises in startup work. Um, so Jill is one of Australia's most preeminent startup or capital raising lawyers. So Jill has um, worked at a large, um, a large number of, sorry, a number of large capital raising firms um, and in Asia, Australia. Um, and at Legal Vision, Jill does a lot of our capital raising work within the corporate team. So as part of that, she does work with safes, convertible notes and equity rounds. Um, and so she'll be talking about her experience working with founders as well as investors. Over to you, Jill. All right, thanks, Madeline. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. So I'm going to be looking at um, how to s get your business ready for um, investment and also the key legal documents that you require when you're raising capital. So just, um, just before we start, sorry, I'm just going to make sure I've got this um, ready. Just before we start, can I just check by a show of hands how many of you have set up a business before? Okay, so quite a few. And how many of you have raised capital before? Okay, so a couple of you. Great. Okay, thanks. So um, we'll look first of all at how to get your um, business ready for um, approaching investors. So the first place um, to start is your business structure. So you need to make sure that you have got a structure in place that um, investors can invest in. Um, and generally, that's going to have to be a company. Um, investors will want to, to invest in a company. They'll want to ho hold shares in a, um, a company because that gives them a limited liability. So you need to make sure you get a, a company set up. Um, some people like to have a dual company structure. So that looks like the diagram on the board. So if essentially you have a holding company set up in which um, initially it will be the founders or the, the sole shareholders, but then as investors come in, they invest in that holding company. And the holding company owns all the valuable assets of the business. So that's gonna be the intellectual property and the cash that you receive from investors. And the holding company will have a operating company, a, a, which will be um, a wholly owned subsidiary and the operating company is the trading company. So that will enter into contracts with clients, customers, um, employees, contractors, um, and suppliers. So the idea is that if someone is going to sue the business, they are going to sue the operating company, which is the, com the company that they have a contract with. And so that means that the um, assets of the business that are owned by the, the holding company are hopefully safe from um, that operational risk. However, there are downsides to having this dual company structure. Um, obviously, it, it has higher setup and running costs because you have to set up two companies instead of the one, and you, ha you have to um, operate those two companies as well. There's more administration involved, so you're gonna have to run both of those companies, which in, you know, involves meetings and things like that, of directors and shareholders. Um, and also there's, there can be more complexity in terms of you're probably going to need intercompany documentation. So for example, if um, your investors um, invest money into your holding company, but you decide that um, you know, your operating company needs some of those funds because you're not making revenue at that level yet, but you need to pay the employees, you're probably gonna have to um, have a loan in place from the holding company to the operating company to get funds down to, to that um, entity. Um, so yeah, there's additional um, complexity there. Um, and also the, there, are, there are ways of um, protecting against operational risk um, that don't involve having a dual company structure, such as you know, taking out um, good insurance against operational risk, and also having really robust contracts in place to limit your liability and things like that. But you should definitely consider whether the dual company structure is worth it for you. For example, if you do, if you are in a very risky business and you have high value assets, but it's not something that VCs will generally insist upon. I don't know, Jackie. Do you have? Does Blackbird have a? Sorry, Airtree <laughs> have a preference on that? Uh, no, no. Yeah. Okay. 
So the next thing you need to think about is IP protection. So it's really important that the company owns the IP that it needs to run the business. So it may be that before you set up your company, the founders have developed IP already um, and they own that personally. So you need to make sure that they uh, assign that IP to the company. And that's usually done by way of an, an assignment deed. You also need to make sure that when you take on employees and contractors, that they assign any IP that they're creating to, to, the, to the business as well. Um, and that's usually done um, if it's an employee through their employment contract, if it's a contractor through their contractor's agreement. Um, make sure that if you have a dual company structure, that the IP is held, uh, it, th that it's not held at by the operating company because then it's obviously at risk. You want to make sure that it's held at the holding company level. Um, so that's obviously going to involve um, an intercompany uh, IP um, document because your employees are going to be assigning it to the operating company because that's where the employment agreement is. And then you need the subsidiary company, the operating company, to assign it up to the holding company. But then the holding company then needs to grant a license to the operating company to use that IP. So generally what you have is an intercompany IP assignment and license agreement under which the operating company assigns the IP up to the holding company and the holding company licenses it back down to the operating company. So just keep that in mind if you do go with the dual company structure. Um, and the last thing about IP is make sure you register um, any important IP that you do own. So make sure you register any trademarks and patents. Um, and also think, think about domain names when you set up your company as well and make sure you own any domain names that you might want to <coughs> use down the track, especially if you're thinking of expanding overseas in the future. So when you set up, if you've got co-founders, um, you're likely, uh, well, you should be thinking about putting in place a shareholders agreement. This will set out the rights and responsibilities of the shareholders um, towards each other. And one of the probably most important things to think about if you do have a co-founder is vesting. Because you want to make sure that you're both locked in to the company um, in the early growth stages. So you don't want to be in a situation where you set up this great company, um, you each have 50 percent of the company, you start approaching investors, um, and then one of, one of you suddenly decides, oh, actually, I don't want to be doing this anymore, so they leave. And so you're now on your own going to investors saying, yeah, I've got this great idea, um, and they're sort of like, well, who's this guy that owns 50 percent? What are they doing? Um, and, you know, it's quite hard to explain that. So you want to make sure that you both stick around um, in the early growth stages. And the way you do that is through vesting. So Vesting basically means that um, until certain conditions are met, your, sh your shares are subject to forfeiture. So the company can buy them back, um, usually for a nominal amount, if you leave the company before, they have, before those criteria have been met. Um, for founders, it's usually time-based vesting, and the common approach that you tend to see is four-year four vesting with a one-year cliff, which basically mean that means that shares vest over four years. Um, if you leave within the first year, you get nothing. So the company can buy everything back. Um, and thereafter, they vest monthly usually over the next three years. Um, and that just ties you in um, to that company for, for the sort of initial stage. Um, okay, so the cap table. You need to make sure you have a cap table in place. It's basically a record of the ownership of the shares in the company. So who are the shareholders? How many shares do they have? What percentage of the company do they own? You also need to remember to record the ESOP pool if you have, if you have an ESOP in place. Um, any safes if you've issued safes or convertible notes if you've issued convertible notes. Um, because that just that's important because people want to know that once they have converted or been exercised, what their share, shareholding will look like. Make sure you've got it ready before investors ask for it because it's going to be really important for them to see what the shareholding is and to be able to work out how much of the company they'll own if they invest um, money in, into the company. And also be, a, be able to explain the share ownership and how key shareholders are motivated. So as we 
as I sort of alluded to before, it's really important to be able to explain who the shareholders are, why they're there, why they own shares, what, what they've provided to, to the business in exchange for those shares, what value they're adding. Um, and also, you need to make sure that the founders own enough to um, prove that they're motivated to keep working on the business once the investors have invested. So if a founder only has 1%, why, should it, why would an investor invest in them? Why, you know, th why would the founder stick with a company and help them grow if they only have 1% of it? Um, and it also helps you understand and forecast your future dilution. So if, you, um, if investors do come in, um, it helps you work out um, what your shareholding will be pushed down to. Okay, um, just very quickly, um, some of the key contracts that you might need to think about um, before you approach investors, you need to make sure you've got employment agreements in place um, with your employees. And obviously a key thing with that is the IP protection. Same with contractors, make sure you've, you've got con contractors agreements in place with them. IP agreements we've already discussed, they, they need to know that the company owns all the IP that is needed to run the business. Um, customer and client contracts, again, they need to know that um, the, the company's um, liability is limited to the extent possible um, and that you've got good contracts in place. Um, if you're an online business, have you got online documents in place? So things like website terms of use, privacy policy, terms and conditions. Um, really important to, again, limit your liability and protect your IP and any supply and distribution agreements you might need. All right, so just moving on to the essential legal documents when you go on to raise capital. So first of all, obviously, there's the term sheet. So um, this sets out the key terms of the investment. So things like the economic terms. So what's the pre-money valuation? What are the minimum and maximum round size? Um, what are the, uh, does the investor get a board seat? Do they have any veto, veto rights over decision making? What are the terms of the shares they're going to get? So will they be preference shares? And if so, what are the, t the, what are the terms of those preference shares? Um, and once, once that's agreed, that will be used to, uh, for the lawyers to draft the, the document. So it's really important to get a good term sheet in place. Um, and, and it's really important to understand the terms of the term sheet that you're agreeing to. Um, once the term sheet has been agreed, you'll then move on to the sort of legal documents. So you'll have a subscription agreement and that sets out the mechanics of the investment. So it'll set out um, what needs to be done in order for the investment to go ahead. So the investor has to pay the purchase price, and then the, you know, the company usually has to meet certain conditions, such as having the IP, in, um, IP assignments in place and things like that, um, and getting all the resolutions required to issue shares. And then on the completion date, um, the uh, shares are issued to the investors. And then the shareholders agreement, as we touched on briefly before, just sets out the, the rights and obligations of the shareholders um, um, in the company. So again, that's a really important document and the, the investors go are going to insist that you have that in place um, to protect their rights. And again, that will contain things like the shareholder vesting and um, you know, any veto rights and things like that that the uh, investors have um, negotiated. You also might need to amend your company constitution if you are issuing preference shares um, because the constitution will need to set out the terms of those preference shares. So that's another thing just to be mindful of. And then finally, uh, the company will need to prepare some share issuance documents. Um, and that will just be sort of the company approvals that are required when issuing new shares. Um, share certificates for the investors. And they'll also need to update their members register and also um, notify ASIC of the investment following, the fo following completion of the share issuance. Um, so that's um, a very quick 15 minute <laughs> summary of um, sort of the legal aspects of um, raising capital and preparing yourself for that. Okay. Um, thank you, Jill. Right on time. Um, so next we'll be hearing from Jackie. So Jackie is an investor at Airtree Ventures, which is an early and growth stage venture firm. Airtree is the largest venture capital fund in Australia um, and over the past two decades over the past two decades, has partnered with over 40 companies, including market leaders such as Canva and Prosper. 
So prior to Airtree, Jackie invested in fintech and adjacent sectors um, at NAB Ventures. Um, and before moving to Sydney, she was um, the chief of staff at Kalo, which is a Series A startup based in San Francisco and London. And that startup had also raised funds from Valar Ventures and Sci-Fi VC. So um, Jackie, over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so VC 101, um, those are some of the most successful VC investors in the world. Um, not everyone who does this job is white, middle-aged, and really nerdy. So <laughs> some people look a little bit more like me, uh, and hopefully more of those in the future. Um, so raising VC versus bootstrapping, I wanted to put this in there. Um, I know you've come to a session about raising VC. Um, I think it's really important for companies to understand whether they really do want to raise VC, because I think raising capital is a way to fund your company um, and can be really appealing when you don't have any money. Um, but there are, it, it's only right for a specific type of company. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a company called Buffer. It's a social media scheduling tool started in about 2011. Um, and I think it's a pretty good story for why some companies aren't right for VC. So they started in 2011 doing really well, got to about four and a half million dollars of revenue by 2014, decided to raise a VC round from um, a great uh, New York-based investor called Collaborative Fund. Um, they put some money in, I think they put in about three million dollars. All going well, 2015 hit, they had all this money, they were spending it on hiring loads of people, and then growth kind of slowed down, and the product wasn't going quite as well as they hoped. And suddenly they ended up in this kind of cash constrained situation that they, they hadn't thought that they would ever run into. And they had to lay off a bunch of people. And for a company that was very, very focused on culture, it really hurt them. And then they started questioning, you know, did they really want to be on this growth track that, that VC investment requires? Um, did they really want to be growing really, really fast um, at the potential detriment to the culture of their company? And so last year, Buffer actually bought out their VC investors. And they decided that what they wanted to do was grow slowly, um, increase profitability, uh, pay dividends out to their existing shareholders, and create a company cu the company culture that they wanted to create. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have great company culture at VC-backed startups, because of course you can. But you do need to grow fast. And I think this is a... It's a philosophical question that you need to ask yourself when you're starting your company, which is, do I want a slow-growing business uh, with a ton of work-life balance where I'm in complete control of every decision that gets made? Or do I want to grow something really big, really quick, um, that has a huge impact on the world or on, on the sector that you're involved in, but comes at the cost of giving it a, a little bit of control and being aligned with your investors such that you are pushing for 100% growth year on year, in the early stage, even 200% growth year on year. Um, so I think that's just a kind of philosophical question that you should ask yourself um, before you look to raise funding. Uh, so if you do decide you want to raise VC, uh, these are the, the criteria that we look for. Um, the most important one for us is team. Um, at the early stages of a company, there aren't really many numbers that we can look at. So Investing in a company based on numbers is, is pretty impossible to do. Uh, team is really, really, really important for us. Um, what we like to see is founders with product experience, technical experience, growth experience, um, any or all of those is, is, is preferable. We look for teams who are gritty and resilient, who have maybe faced challenging situations in the past and toughed it out. Um, your startup journey is gonna be long and it is gonna be hard and you will probably almost run out of money at some point and it's just gonna be painful and you need to be able to get through that. And so we look for indicators that someone has the resilience to, to go the distance. Um, we also want to invest in people who can inspire people around them because that helps with raising money, that helps with hiring people, that helps with getting customers. Um, we look for teams that have domain expertise. Um, that's not necessary, but it is one of the factors that we take into consideration. Um, 
outside of team, market opportunity, that kind of is mostly about, is this a big market that you can build a big business in? Um, if you are a company that sells something to plumbers in Australia, that's probably not going to be a big enough market for us. Um, if your market is freelancers around the world, that probably is a big enough market for us. Um, there are all sorts of contrary examples to this. Um, Uber was a small market. Taxis was a small market. Uber made it huge. Those things do happen, but we like to have an indication that the market is pretty big for, this com for the company to grow into. Um, product market fit is a difficult term to define, and I'll go into that a little bit more in the, in the next group of slides. Um, but really, it's kind of a, a, a measure of how much do people love using your product. Uh, unit economics, that is effectively, do the financials of your business make sense? Um, are you charging an amount that means that you will be able to acquire customers and pay your employees um, and continue to grow in a, in a way that would be profitable if you weren't reinvesting in growth? Um, most of the time, our companies aren't profitable for a long period of time but they could be if they wanted to be. They're just choosing to reinvest all, all the money they gain from revenue in further growth. Um, clear differentiation, this is really, really important to us as well. Um, differentiation can mean a lot of things. Uh, it can mean barriers to entry like uh, network effects. So social networks obviously do so well because with each person that joins, the, the product becomes more useful to each for the next person that joins. Um, that could be data. Uh, so if you have a source of data that nobody else has access to, uh, that's a differentiator. IP can be a differentiator, um, albeit one that's quite difficult to defend sometimes. Um, economies of scale, that's a differentiator. So what Amazon's able to do with logistics and distribution is pretty powerful. Um, financials is another one. So this is less important at the really early stages. Um, you're not going to have much to show, but what we really want to understand is what's your burn rate? How much cash are you spending every month? And so how long can, can your, this investment sustain you for? And what's your plan for kind of spending over the next year to 18 months? Um, and likely exit options. This is um, neither here nor there really. We think about it, it's important to us, but uh, it's usually not a deal breaker. Um, so product market fit, going into this in a bit more detail, um, it's really about people loving the product. And this is so important for us because product is everything. A great product experience, like you know, our most successful investment today has been Canva. Canva is an amazing, amazing product to use. Um, and, and that is the reason it's been so successful in a market where if you'd, if you'd been pitched that idea, and they pitched 160 investors before they got a yes, if you pitched that idea, they would be like, why would that work? Adobe will do it, someone else will do it, one of the giants will, will succeed in this market. But they built a product that was amazing, and their engagement metrics were so great that you know, investors just wanted to sign up immediately to their Series A. Um, how do you measure that? Low churn is a, is a really important measure. You, know, you want all your customers to stay with you. Um, MRR expansion, that, that's um, monthly recurring revenue, and that means uh, are people spending more money with you each month? So not only are they staying with the product, they're also starting to spend more and more. That could be adding more seats on their team of people who are using the product or expanding to different departments within the company, that kind of thing. Um, high repeat rates for marketplaces. So marketplaces don't really work if no one's ever going to come back. Um, so if you're Airtasker, you want people to be um, getting, getting jobs done as often as possible. So you don't need to get new users because you know your existing users will keep coming back. Um, and, and two and three are, are basically four as well. Um, high engagement, that could be measured by monthly active users, daily active users, weekly active users. Of your weekly active users, how many people come back every day? Um, this is particularly relevant for consumer-facing products, which aren't necessarily going to be using revenue as their bar for, for growth. Um, something like a Snapchat would be a great example of a product that could say, we have people coming and using this every single day. They spend X hours per week on, on the app, 
Um, and that shows that there is huge value to be had here. Um, and viral coefficient, that is effectively a word of mouth spreading. So um, you want your existing users to be telling their friends about it and more and more people to be signing up. And so kind of another story here is, I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard of a, of a company called Superhuman. Is anyone? Show of hands? No, okay, so this shows what industry I'm in. Um, Superhuman is an email app um, and what it does is it makes email way better for people who use email a lot. And thinking about this, when you saw this, you'd think, that sounds rubbish. There's already Gmail, there's already Outlook. Why would someone need a, a tool that makes their email better? Um, and that's what a lot of people felt like in early 2017 when they started uh, testing their product with users. And so when they saw that stat, they thought, okay, how are we gonna improve this? This is really important. Um, and so they said, okay, who is our product for? Let's really define really closely, okay, who exactly is our product for? It's not just for anyone who uses email. It's for people who live in emails, people who spend three or four hours a day in email. Okay, who are those people? Are they CEOs? Are they um, lawyers? <laughs> um, are they venture capital investors? Who, who are these people who are using email so much that a time saving of, I don't know, half a second per email or a couple of seconds per email actually adds up to a lot for them. Uh, and so they narrowed it down, narrowed it down, narrowed it down. They go, okay, what are those, those specific people, the CEOs, say? What do they love about the product? How do we do more of that? What's holding them back from, from using the product more? How do we make those things okay? And over time, they refined, 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 and got themselves up to 58% 50 of people would be very disappointed if they didn't use this product. That's huge. That means, I mean, that kind of um, is a forward indicator of revenue expansion, uh, low churn, all those other things that we're looking for. Um, and so this is kind of an indicator of what you needed to, to do. Um, to get to product market fit, and product market fit is what investors love to see. So tips for fundraising success. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, um, storytelling is hugely important for founders. Um, you're going to need to tell this story again and again and again and again and again to the point where you're so sick of the sound of your own voice and so sick of what your company does that, that you never want to say it ever again. Um, Explain it to investors like they're three-year-olds. They have n almost definitely no idea about the complexities of the industry that you are building a product in. And there is this thing called the curse of knowledge where you, know, you, don't, you don't remember what it was like to not know about your industry. Um, and the only way really to kind of bring this back into view for you is just to test it out on loads of people. Um, so test it out on your best mate, test it out on your ex-colleagues, all, all these people who don't necessarily know about um, the industry that you're building the product in, um, and, and, and pitch them and then ask them, what didn't you understand? What did you understand? What was really interesting about that? What wasn't interesting? Where did you get bored? Where did you want to check your phone? Uh, all of those things. Um, we, yeah, so, you know, if, a, if an investor doesn't understand your product, they're never going to invest in you. So that's kind of the first thing you really need to get sorted. Um, get to know your, oh look, I did tip two and tip two. That's good. Um, get to know your investors before your fundraising. We talk about this thing called lines, not dots. Um, and that is effectively, we don't want to meet you at the point in time where you're raising money. We want to meet you beforehand and see how you're progressing up until the point where you raise money. So we want to meet you when you're two people with a good idea so that 12 months later, we can say, oh, look, uh, or even six months later, two people with a good idea built a product. They tested that with users. That's amazing. Okay, they've got a first few customers. And then six months after that, we can say, they've gone from first few customers to hundreds of customers. That's amazing. So rather than them meeting you at, you've got hundreds of customers, that's great. They've met you at, you've gone from zero to hundreds of customers in 12 months. We've watched you execute. We've watched you grow. That's really impressive. 
So that's kind of the thing that you, you want to make investors feel both like bought into the journey and also really impressed with your speed. Because speed is the only thing that makes startups succeed. It's the only thing they have, is the ability to execute really, really quickly and iterate. So if you can prove early on that you operate at speed, that's amazing. Um, so in terms of the amount you want to invest, uh, you want to raise, um, there are a whole bunch of ways of thinking about it. Um, usually it's, you know, how much money do I need to get to last me 18 months to get to the metrics that I want to prove to be able to raise my next round of funding? That's the kind of barometer that we think about. Um, if you can set it out of the lower end of that, that's a good thing because you want to be in a position where you want to raise a million dollars and you have investors who want to who want to invest a million and a half. And at that point, you can choose whether or not you want to take a million and a half. But if you go out with a million and a half and you only get a million, that's a really negative indicator and you may end up with nothing. So it's worth kind of setting it towards the lower end and, and trying to get yourself to an over, oversubscribed position. Um, and, and kind of following on from that, start fundraising when you're in a strong position and that's way more likely to get you to that oversubscribed point. So read, there's every, all this stuff's online now, it's not hard to find. Um, think, read more about uh, where seed stage companies are when they're raising investment and I'm very happy to talk about this afterwards as well. Um, and what do I need to prove to get there and say I want to be 20% more than that uh, when I go out to raise so that it's like a no-brainer for these investors. They, you want the first person you meet at a fund to immediately go back to their investment committee meeting and go, I need, I need, someone to meet, I need everyone to meet these founders. They're really impressive. Look what they've managed to achieve in the last 18 months. You don't want them to come out going, yeah, they've done pretty well. Um, they could be a little bit further. I'm not as sure about it because then they won't go into their investor committee meeting and kind of beat the table about, about everyone meeting you. Um, and final point, it's going to take ages to do. It just does. Um, way longer than you think. You're going to do all those other points I suggested. You're going to be the perfect company, and it's just still going to take you ages because sometimes it just does. Um, so make sure you have enough runway to last a few months um, and, and prepare your business for the fact that you might be out of the business meeting investors a lot of the time. Um, so maybe you're, you're co you split it by co-founder and one co-founder um, does all the investor meetings and the other one makes sure the product's running and the employees are going and everything's, everything else is working well while the first founder is, is distant a bit of the time. So that's something else to, to think about. Uh, in your first meeting, this is the stuff you need. Um, research the VC. Don't just send the, the same email to every VC or get the same intro with the same everything. What, you, what an investor would be surprised to receive because they very rarely receive is, hi, um, Jackie, I've seen that you're super interested in my sector because I saw that blog post you wrote once or that tweet you once put out. Um, so I think you'd be really interested in meeting me um, for X, Y, and Z reasons, blah, blah, blah. Um, know what kind of check size that fund writes, if there's any specific sectors that they invest in, um, whether they are willing to lead rounds or whether they only follow rounds. This stuff is information that is available. Um, and is it, otherwise, you're just going to waste time talking to a bunch of people who wouldn't invest in you anyway. Um, so that's really important. Share your why. That's kind of the storytelling um, part. Make sure you include stuff about yourself as well, because people want to know who they're investing in. And like I said before, kind of team's the most important thing. Uh, send your deck beforehand. It means that the investor will go into the meeting with a little bit of context and a little bit of idea of the questions they want to ask you. So it can kind of shortcut a second meeting sometimes. Uh, demo your product. So it, that kind of goes to, to the point I was mentioning earlier, which is um, people, <sighs> demo your product. Uh, people won't understand your product until they see it or, or until you explain it to them like they're three years old. Um, if someone can see and feel what it's about, they can understand it uh, much more deeply. I went yesterday, two days ago, um, to meet with a LiDAR company based here in Sydney. And they drove me around their car and showed me the LiDAR on a screen in front of me. And it's the most amazing experience. It makes you feel so deep in with like, I understand what this company is all about. 
um, and it can be really powerful. So, so if they can, even if it's just a, an app or a, a software product, it's it's still really powerful. Uh, and know your metrics. That's pretty basic. If if an investor asks you questions about your company, they expect you to know the answer to them. Um, so make sure you do beforehand. And that's this is just a slide to say you know. Exceptional founders can come from anywhere. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to come from a similar background. Every single one of these people came from a different place uh, with different experience um, and are building amazing companies that are gonna, that are gonna disrupt their industries. So, yeah, uh, exciting. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, so now we're going to move into the Q&A um, part of the session. Um, so I'm sure that you've got some questions. Um, I also have some questions that I might throw out there. So for context, I'm a lawyer. I work with Jill. Um, and so there's some things that we get asked all the time from founders. So if no one hits on those, I might um, ask those myself. But first, I think we'll start with the crowd. Um, does anyone have a question? Yeah, up the back. There's a mic coming to you. I suppose you use OK. Um, I just want to ask what sort of model you use for evaluation as an investor and also can you share some experience when there is a disagreement between the founder and the investor on the evaluation? Thank you. Um, so the model we use is the one I showed you beforehand which is team product founder, uh, team product market opportunity, differentiation, unit economics. That's the kind of framework we look through. Um, and we'll assess based on all of those different elements. Oh, you mean how do we oh, how do we value it? Right. Okay. Um, we it it depends on a few things. Um, it'll depend on the strength of the founding team. It'll depend on the uh, traction of the product to date. Uh, it'll depend on the stage of the company. Um, you know, at a later stage when you have more numbers, it's clearer because you can look at the numbers and you can look at the kind of multiples, multiple of revenue that other companies tend to um, to raise at um, or to be valued at, um, and so that's that's slightly clearer. Um, at the start, it's it's a large number of things, all the way from kind of product adoption to to revenue growth to engagement to uh, supply and demand for the round, all sorts of things. Uh, and to your second question about what do we do when the founders and the investors disagree on the valuation, um, it's, it's like any negotiation. Um, everyone has a position, um, but we try and negotiate and get to a, to a middle ground that's, that's, that's good for everyone. I mean, we, don't wanna, we never want to leave a founder with a bad taste in their mouth at the end of, a, at the end of an investment round, because you know, you're going on a 10-year journey with a, with a founder, and you don't want it to start off on the wrong note. So... Um, and you know, valuation at, in the early days of a company is 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 slightly um, it's not it's not clear. So we can move a little bit. I think you know, when, when someone comes to you with a you know a company that has a good idea and small product and maybe one customer and says they're worth thirty million dollars, then we're probably not going to get there. But um, usually, it's a negotiation that that, that works pretty well. well. Right. Thank you. Does someone else have a question? I've got a question for Jackie. Um, Jackie, are you looking more to invest in B2B companies or B2C companies? Question one. Because B2Cs will need much more capital, whereas B2Bs, got a, it's more qualitative capital. And question two, um, which I had, I just forgot question two. So <laughs> ask question one and I'll think about, oh, I just forgot question two, it was a good question. Um, oh, we yeah, question, yeah, uh, answer question one and I'll give you question two later. Okay. Um, we are agnostic as to B2B or B2C companies. I think, um, there have been fewer examples of massive um, consumer businesses built out of Australia. Um, so I think the bar is slightly higher on that because it's just hard often to do it outside of, say, the US or China. Um, but not impossible, Canva did it. So well, Canva's now become kind of a B2B product as well. But um, I think you know, it's, it's doable, but the bar's probably slightly higher. Um, on VC. Question two about the team. Uh, would the VC have a dilemma if some of the teams based outside of the jurisdiction of Australia? Because we've got some very good biomedical engineers based overseas, um, et cetera. Ireland is number two in medical device development, as you might know. Um, but my question is as follows. If some of the team is based outside of Australia, 
but the funding occurs in Australia, especially the technical team, you know, there are some, like I said, good engineers outside. Does that cause a dilemma for the VC or do they prefer all the team to be housed within the jurisdiction here? Doesn't bother us at all. Good. Um, you know, I think distributed teams are becoming more and more of a thing. Um, particularly, yeah, the cost of living is pretty high in, in, in cities like Sydney and Melbourne. You know, it's, it's, it's not unreasonable to imagine that you, know, you can have great dev teams based in different parts of the world um, who can build your business for cheaper and at the same quality. Um, so, no, it doesn't, it doesn't affect us. Thanks. Yeah, was there someone else? Over here, I think I saw your hand first. <laughs> Uh, I think it's being recorded, so we'll just pass this to you. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Leah for Coastline. I just want to ask you, as an investor, um, is it more attractive usually if you got a company that's usually got an exit strategy to a larger, you know, market as opposed to seeing something that you want to stick with in the long term to grow? I think our first reaction is to always want the company to keep growing and stick with it. Um, you know, ultimately, our job is to make as much money for our, our investors as we possibly can. Um, and often the best way to do that is to stick with a great company as it grows and grows and grows through to IPO. Um, so we don't traditionally look for early sales um, of companies to, to, to corporates. And you know, so for some companies, that is the right thing. So it's, okay. it's, there's it's never a, a perfect decision. Yeah. But, but we'd like to stick with our companies for the long run. <laughs> Hi, my name's Camilla. Thank you for your advice so far. My question's probably more directed at Jackie at this point. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's fine by me. <laughs> what I'm interested in is tips you might have for startups who perhaps aren't in a position to get a product out into the market to build at this point. So they're pre-revenue, but looking obviously for funding to help get to that point. Because a lot of the advice out there is around people who have already proven their product and have a small customer base, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you get to that point? With so um, there are a lot of ways to kind of get proof that people want your product um, early. So you know, obviously getting out the door and talking to customers is the first thing you should be doing when you start any startup. Um, and you know, in my company, so my old company that I worked at um, called Kalo was a freelancer management software. And we got our first customers by uh, running them through a demo, of which, which was a click clickable prototype. Um, so you go into something like Figma, um, build, you know, you don't need to be technical to do this, um, build a prototype, um, go to customers, say, what do you think about this? Uh, does this workflow work? Does this solve your problems? All this kind of thing. And, and you can get to the point where you can pre-sell a product um, just from having built a great clickable prototype. Um, so we did that. It's been done by tons of other people. Um, so that's probably a great first step. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the front here, I think, so. I had a question regarding cold intros versus warm intros. So if someone just approaches an investor cold, uh, how do you guys respond to that? And I'm um, assuming warm intros, it's probably you take it up a lot quicker. So I feel relatively strongly about this because I feel that sometimes warm intros can mean that you have to belong to a certain demographic or social group to have that warm intro. I think sometimes it isn't that easy. Having said that, your job as a founder is to, to find ways to get to talk to people. Um, and so being able to find a way to get a warm intro to invest an investor is almost a way of proving that you'll be able to get customers in the future um, because you have to find a way. Um, and that kind of spirit is something that we look for. Um, so long and short of it is everyone who cold emails me, I will read the email and I will respond to it. Um, if you get a warm intro, that also works, and it's kind of a, a, a particularly if it's not from like your mate from school, um, shows that you're kind of entrepreneurial spirit, spirit as well. Hi, another question for Jackie. I have a question for Jill as well, but <laughs> first for Jackie. Um, so on this side of the fence, 
looking at different VC companies, how do you advise founders to go about which VCs to approach and which VCs are good, bad, indifferent, some are better than others? Um, what's your view on that? So um, definitely do the research around what stage of company they invest in, what sector they invest in, if they lead or follow rounds. Um, that stuff's important. Um, that will inform your choice. And then talk to other founders. So look at the por their portfolio um, and see if you can get in touch with any of the founders in their portfolio and, and ask them what they're like as an investor. Um, that's probably the, the most honest way to get feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And, and Jill, uh, I studied law as well. I didn't become a lawyer. Uh, I'm just curious about the legal fees and at what point you would recommend, or perhaps this is where the, the investors have a recommendation, at what point do you engage the lawyers to actually uh, spend some serious time and therefore some serious bucks on, on your product? So um, I would say that I think it's really important to get a term sheet reviewed by a lawyer in the startup space before you sign it. Uh, we see a lot of people come to us with a signed term sheet and um, you know if we have um, a few questions on it, um, if something's not clear, they just often they can't explain what they think it's meant to say, um, or they don't understand comple uh, complex issues and they don't understand the ramifications of them. So it's really important to get it reviewed to make sure you do understand everything and that there's no flags um, that you should try and negotiate out of it before you signed it, because it's really hard to start renegotiating once you've got a signed term sheet in place. Um, and then obviously, once the term sheet is signed, you're gonna have to get a lawyer to look at the documents for you. Um, and that's probably really important. Um, often you can get lawyers to, um, you, you know, you only have to pay their fees once you've received the funds from investors, so that can really help you. Um, and you can um, use the investment funds to pay those legal fees so that you know you'll have the money to mm. pay that. Um, so that can help, um, but yeah, it's important to to get good legal advice, I would say. Because I, I know that with employee stock option programs, uh, intellectual property, those things actually yeah. have to come before absolutely. the term sheet. So yeah, absolutely, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, if you're, if you're a founder and you haven't got any employees yet, uh, I'm guessing you'd be saying, okay, well, get, get those things in place yeah. before you hire well, anybody. Well, I mean, some you need, some you don't. Mm. For example, the employee share option plan, you don't need to have that drafted until you're ready to issue the options. So yeah, it's important to, you might need to specify in your shareholders agreement what the pool is, uh, what the percentage pool is, um, but you don't actually need to draft the documents until you're ready to issue the options. But yeah, I, I would say that IP agreements are really important. There are a lot of, um, you, you can obtain some documents um, online for free these days, some really good ones. Um, so it's worth looking into that, um, mm -hmm. especially if you're starting out and you've really got no funds. Um, they usually make do at least until you get proper documents in place, until you have the money to do that. Um, so things like IP assignment deeds, you could certainly find one online for free, and I think we probably have them on our website. Um, so, yeah, look out for things like that. And online documents as well, things like that, privacy policy, website terms of use. But again, we've got all of those documents on our website for free, so um, just look for things like that um, it's so and av avoid spending money where you can. And if you're looking for information around term sheet, standard term sheet or uh, employee stock option, um, if you go on the Airtree website, we have a, we've open sourced a bunch of documents um, that early stage founders would want to use. And our term sheet, while you should definitely check it with a lawyer before you sign anything, um, it's pretty simple okay. um, and it's pretty clean. So okay. it's a good one if, if you if you want to do the term sheet part yourself and just then just that's a good way to 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 see what's standard. I might jump in really quickly with a follow-up question on the term sheet point and then we can come to you. Um, so obviously when you're looking over a term sheet, there's a few things that might stand out as concerning or things that you just want to make sure you fully understand. But Jill, is there one thing in particular that you think founders should keep a close eye on when looking at it through a term sheet? I, sorry, I, um, I guess probably the main things are, would be around the, the preference shares and their terms. So if you are seeing things like um, a two times liquidation preference or anywhere above a one times liquidation preference or a um, participating um, preference share, then you know they, that you should start 
that should start ringing al alarm bells. We shouldn't really be um, expecting anything above a one times non-participating. So just things like that um, are things to look out for. <coughs> Thank you for your patience, your turn. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing all this uh, valuable information. So I think I have a question and would love to hear uh, feedback from both of you. Uh, it's regarding the IP and uh, specifically patents. So uh, how important it is uh, to have a patent when, uh, when you consider in investing and what it takes to get a patent, filed at least? I'm not actually a patent attorney, so I'm not sure of the process that you need to go through, um, but do you know anything about that? I would just say that uh, like any kind of IP, if something is super valuable to your business, going through the registration process and being able to show um, that you've taken steps to protect it would be attractive. Um, but yeah, I do understand that there are, it is quite administrative and can be quite costly as well. Um, so I guess determining whether this particular IP is valuable enough to invest <coughs> in that protection is probably your first step. Um, and then also speaking to a lawyer and getting some quotes and understanding of the process and the time it's going to take will obviously be um, valuable. But Jackie, do you have a preference on whether patents make a difference to the value of the startup? It's exactly you? what you said, which is if um, the IP is the core of what differentiates <coughs> the product, then um, that's the time where it becomes really important to get it to at least start the process of getting it protected. Uh, and at, le at least having done a patent review and seeing what else is out there as well, in case it's already owned by someone else. Okay. I've just got one other question about non-disclosure yeah. agreements. We were just at Australian Healthcare Week. There was a start-up by a doctor regarding getting consent from patients for operating theatres, etc. And one of, the, uh, one of the judges asked, well, can't I copy this? And her question was, go ahead and try it. So my question to you is, how important are non-disclosure agreements? Do, as VCs or lawyers, do you always advocate for one, number two? And at the end, that doesn't come down to trust, because I've signed a number of NDAs, and they never disclosed anything at the end of the day. One was in cardiothoracics, one was for 3D, uh, like a femoral artery, uh, insertion into the heart, etc. cetera. It, it showed nothing at the end. So what's been your experience with NDAs? Are they valuable? Are they important? Should we enforce them, etc.? Look, a, a, a lot of people just think that NDAs aren't worth the paper they're written on, basically. And I, I think a lot of VCs as well would be pretty taken aback if you asked them to sign one. Is, is, would you say that? We Jeremy? probably get asked to sign one about once a week, and we've never said yes. Mm. Um, I think like, what's important to understand <laughs> is it's our job to keep this stuff confidential. And if we were to not keep it confidential and someone talked about that, to other founders, as they would have the right to do, um, our entire reputa reputation is destroyed and our business goes under. So it's completely in our interest to maintain confidentiality as well. Right, was there a question yeah. here? Thanks. Uh, just I actually have a question about the financial projection, Jackie. Um, how many years of financial projection do you think a uh, founder need to present the things? And also with in terms of the revenue and the sales, do you think that the founders need to be optimistic? Uh, with the with the figures um, or just consider the whole market for the future I know it's just a number but uh uh, so on, to your first point on the um, on the projections I would say at the earliest stage of the business um, it's always going to be wrong mm -hmm. so I think you need to have thought about it um, and you need to have a plan that shows you've you've considered all the different assumptions um, and and this is what you're expecting um, for the next 12 to 18 months, and definitely no longer than that. Um, but realistically, it's for us, it's much more about how you've thought about it than what the absolute numbers are. Mm. Were there any other questions from the crowd? Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, I just got a quick question for Joe, I guess. like. Because um, we're dealing with the international business and when we sort of sign an agreement, we're kind of like using uh, either neutral Singaporean law or Hong Kong law. And I <coughs> recently I got lots of feedback from <coughs> international partners that they don't prefer the Hong Kong law because they feel that, <coughs> excuse me, being influenced by Chinese government. Can you sort of give a bit of brief comments on that? Thanks. 
Um, I can't say I know a lot about Hong Kong law, unfortunately. Um, generally, if you're an Australian company, you would probably want your agreements to be governed by the laws of Australia, um, because, uh, and you, you would want the jurisdiction to be Australia as well, because it's more um, convenient for you if any action was taken. Um, so that's sort of the, the common um, approach that you would see. Um, it may be that because your counterparties are based overseas that you've chosen a different jurisdiction um, and one that they prefer. So if they prefer, um, I don't know, Hong Kong law to Australian law because they're more familiar with it or, or, or for some other reason, um, you know, that, that's obviously something that you can do. Um, but uh, as for you, um, generally I would be looking to try and keep it as Australian law if you can. Can you also can you also comment on in terms of the Singaporean law and Hong Kong law, like um, you know, because normally when you're dealing with international partners, they kind of like, you know, they want to they prefer their own sort yeah. of country, then you sort of stick with Australia, and then you have to find a common ground some somewhere. Yeah. So that's where like we normally use Hong Kong and Singaporean law, but um, I guess you know I just sort of got this feedback recently, so I just you know if you have any experience dealing with that and and also, you know, which sort of, uh, you know, which one you prefer, either Singaporean law or Hong Kong law? Um, to be honest, I haven't dealt with either. So we just practice Australian law, so, and we only advise on Australian law, so um, I can't really comment on that, sorry. I might ask another question um, while we're still going, <laughs> if that's okay with everyone. Um, so in Jill's presentation, she spoke about um, the importance of getting your cap table in order. Um, but on that, I then have a question for Jackie. So um, founder ownership is obviously quite important to incentivise. Is there a particular percentage that you like to see the founders hold um, to show that they're incentivised, or are you fairly flexible with that? Um, a meaningful amount, um, probably. So it depends on the stage of the company, because as the company grows, uh, the founders get more and more diluted um, by virtue of new investors coming in. Um, at the earliest stages, we would want them to own the vast majority of the company. Um, if we were doing, you know, if, if it was the first round of capital, we'd expect them to own 100%. If it was, you know, th they'd probably then give away 20% roughly at each round of capital. So, you know, as long as you're keeping within those bounds, um, that kind of makes sense. You know, I think the least, you know, at, at Series D stage, if the, if the founder owned only 20%, that would also be fine, I'm sure. Okay. Um, well, I think we probably have time for one more question from the crowd, if there is one. Um, otherwise, we can wrap it up. Oh, perfect. Cheers. Um, this is a question to the whole panel. In the last few years, there's been an increased prevalence in the use of safes uh, when raising capital. I'd love to get your thoughts on safes as, a co as opposed to convertible notes or other forms of uh, equity. I'll go first. Um, so as the name suggests, they're much simpler. So they're usually sort of like eight pages, whereas convertible notes can be much longer. Um, they're a lot simpler than um, uh, convertible notes in terms of uh, the way they're drafted. They're usually very, um, uh, they're not bespoke. So you usually have one sort of form. There are there are sort of usually three triggers on which your the, the money that goes in um, converts into um, shares. Um, in terms of advantages for the company, it's good because it's not a debt, so there's no term. So if one of the triggers never occurs, you keep the money. Um, and usually there's no interest, which is also good. So if, if you have a convertible note, um, sometimes interest can be charged, and so then it can become a bit of an administrative nightmare um, when you come to um, the, you know, the conversion or the repayment, uh, well, usually it's conversion, so trying to work out, um, especially if it's um, a trigger that is a, um, a capital raise, so if completion keeps getting pushed back, you have to keep recalculating the interest rate um, and the number of shares that will be issued to the safe holders um, and um, redoing the cap table, um, which is a real nightmare. Um, so th where are the, the conversion mechanics and the sort of general mechanics of the two documents are very similar, but obviously the, the term of the loan has that sort of increased um, complexity to the convertible note because you have to work out if it gets to that maturity, what valuation is it going to convert at then, which can be quite difficult. Jackie. 
I don't really have anything else to say other than what you, what you said already. Um, uh, you know, I think pricing around versus not pricing around is more the decision that you want to make. Um, those have pros and cons. Um, safe versus convertible note, as, as Jill mentioned, you know, it can be slightly simpler. Um, I haven't done many yet. Um, I think convertible notes are still what we're seeing more of, um, but I'm sure that will change in the future. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot more safes now. Um, and I would say also that they're usually cheaper as well because they're, there's not much to negotiate in them. So they're usually pretty straightforward. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your questions and your engagement. It's been great. Um, we'll be hanging around a little bit if you've got some questions. Um, but otherwise, yeah, mingle and enjoy yourselves. Thanks. Thank